Hello and welcome back to the Hive School. In today's video, we're starting a new series called Your First Day, where we take a look at a piece of software from the point of view of someone who's never used it before. Our focus for today's episode is going to be on disguise. In previous videos, my focus has been on sharing tips and tricks that are lesser known and maybe not included in the manual. However, for these to make sense, I've assumed that you already know the basics of using that software. In today's video, we'll be starting right from the very beginning. The goal for this session is to guide you from downloading the Disguise installer all the way to programming your first piece of media. To get started, you're going to need to visit download.disguise.one and download the software. This assumes you have a license key to use designer. If you don't have a dongle, you can get one at store.disguise.one. At the time of making this video, Disguise is giving away free licenses, so it's a really great time to try it out if you haven't already. Disguise is constantly under development, with the latest version always available at the top of the page. If you scroll down the page a bit, you'll see a tab labelled Previous Versions, where you can find older builds of the software. If you're new to Disguise, starting with the latest software version is definitely recommended. Here are the recommended system specifications for using Designer. They're not particularly high, so most modern laptops should be able to run it. However, it's worth checking just in case. It's also worth remembering that Disguise is Windows only, so if you're on a Mac, you might need to borrow a laptop. Once you've installed Disguise, go to your Start menu and look for D3 Manager. By default, Disguise will create a folder called D3 Projects inside the Documents folder on your computer. This is where your Disguise projects will be stored. You can view the file path for this folder in the drop-down bar at the top of the D3 Manager window. Below the file path is a list of Disguise projects on your system. If you've only just installed Disguise, you'll likely only see the Start project. To create your own project, select File, New Project from the top menu and then give your project a name and click Create. You can also create a new project using the keyboard shortcut Control N. Before launching your project, it's worth taking a look at the Disguise folder structure. To quickly access our project, we can right click on it and select Open Folder. This will open the Disguise project within Windows Explorer. If we go up one level, we'll see a folder with the same name you gave when you created your project. This is your project folder and contains everything you need for your pro Disguise project to run. If you were transferring your project from your laptop to a disguise machine, this is the folder you would need to move. Back inside that project folder, you'll find a file with a .d3 file extension. This is your project file. Next to it is the objects folder where we will load content into your project. Upon opening the objects folder, you'll see several subfolders. The most important ones are video file for video and stills content, audio for audio files, and notch file for notch blocks. Please stay tuned for a future video for your first day in Notch. Now we've covered the basics of installation and project creation, it's time to launch your first project. Double click on the name of your project in the D3 Manager and Disguise will load. When you load your first Disguise project, you'll see the 3D visualizer with a person, a projector, and a surface. The timeline is located along the bottom of the screen. It's where you'll be placing your media. There are two views in Disguise interface, the visualizer, which is where you'll build and program your show, and the feed view, which is where you'll configure the hardware you're working on and set up your outputs. To orbit around an item, like the person, click and hold and then drag your mouse. Scrolling your mouse button lets you dolly in and out, and holding the tab key on the keyboard lets you pan around. Let's explore the other parts of the top menu, starting with the D3 logo at the top left. Right-clicking it will bring up some tools related to your project, the most important of these is project settings, where you can configure things like refresh rate and bit depth. Moving to the right, we have our track selection box. Currently, your project only has a single track, which is the one visible at the bottom. However, it's possible to have multiple tracks within your project. We often use these to separate different parts of the show, such as songs within an artist's set or different acts within a play. Continuing to the right, we have the stage menu. Left-clicking this selects the visualizer view, just as left clicking feed cl selects the feed view. Right clicking the stage menu brings up a list of all the assets in your project. We can open up the various headings to see the objects that we have in our scene, like the projector and the surface. The settings at the top control some of the basics of our scene, like the size of the floor and the number of people in the scene. Neither the floor or the people actually affect our output, but they can be really useful for visualizing our project. Moving on to the transport menu, we can set up external control of our disguise system from incoming signals like timecode and artnet. We can also build a multi-transport system here that allows us to play back multiple pieces of media asynchronously. However, multi-transports are beyond the scope of this first look session, and we may maybe do a more advanced lesson in the future. 
Finally, we have the devices menu, which relates to external hardware, such as routers and projectors. This is also where we do our initial setup of things like ArtNet and OSC before we use them elsewhere in our project. To find the toolbar, there's a fader for controlling output opacity. This allows us to adjust the brightness of our outputs without changing any of the programming. There's also a volume fader, which allows us to adjust the audio output of our machine. The last button on the toolbar has fade up written on it. Pressing this button fades our outputs down over a second, or up over a second. We can also freeze them. These are features useful quickly making changes while live. At the bottom of the screen you'll find the transport controls, which will help you navigate the timeline. There are three different types of play button, play, play to end of section, and play loop. It might be difficult to understand how they work without looking at timeline splits, which we'll do in a moment while we program our first queue. Additionally, there's a stop button, next and previous section button, go to start of track, next and previous track, and record button. Now that we've completed the interface tour, it's time to program our first queue. If you feel familiar with editing software, like Final Cut or Premiere, you might be used to dragging media onto the timeline. However, disguise works a little bit differently. We place boxes onto the timeline, which we call layers, and these layers contain all the parameters relating to what's happening on the timeline, including which media to load. It might sound confusing, but don't worry, it definitely isn't. To start your first queue, move the playhead to the desired location on the timeline, right click and label your layer at the top of the box that appears. Click OK and you'll see a list of layer types that this guys can use. Click video to add a video layer to the timeline. Under the media heading, there's a video parameter which will open up the media picker. You can browse the different media that comes with a disguise project. It might not be particularly inspiring, but it should be enough to allow us to program our first queue. For example, let's select a test pattern. As you can see from the time markings on the timeline, the default length of a video layer is one minute. You can change this by left clicking on the arrow on the end of the layer and dragging it. For example, we're going to make this 15 seconds long. If we press play, after 15 seconds we'll reach the end of our layer and our projection surface will go black. However, this might not always be what we want. To modify this, we'll use a section break and look at the different types of play mode I discussed earlier. There are two different ways to create a section break. Firstly, you can right click on the timeline where you want your section break and choose split section. Alternatively, you can move your playhead to where you want it and use the keyboard shortcut Alt S. Both do the same thing. I'm going to put one right at the end of our media. The first type of play mode is called play and it will play forwards and ignore all of our breaks as if they weren't there. The second type is play to end of section. When we come to the end of the red section here, the playhead will stop. We'll wait for us to give some inputs and we can hit next section button to move on. Finally, there's the play loop mode. When it comes to a section break, it will loop back around to the start of the section and play it again. Let's recap what we've learned. We downloaded the disguise installer from download.disguise.one installed it and created a new project. We took a tour of the user interface and learned how section breaks and play modes work. We created our first queue. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel. Please leave a comment if you have any questions about this video or if there's anything else you'd like to see on the channel in the future. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you don't miss our next video. From everyone here at the Hive School, we'll see you next time. Thank you.